we generally don't like to know that we are traveling on a accident-prone planet. You, of course, understand that I am not a prophet of doom, just the other way around. I believe that we are now, if the man himself will not be the cause of his destruction, we are now in a settled uh, solar system for eons to come. But in the past, there were, in, in human memory, these very events that, by reconstruction of which, I could put all those claims, what you call predictions, that now, like Professor Barron, Professor Moss, and others writing to science, and others claim for me these predictions, an unusual prediction, because it was not thing that could be accepted, could be uh, put into accepted uh, scheme. And understand, please, Venus is the last, last link in the theory, if there were catastrophes. Of the 7.5 billion residents of planet Earth, 85% are pulp theists, believing in a deity of some form or another. Of those 85%, 2.5 billion believe in a sky fairy, talking snakes, magical fruit, unicorns, and just about anything else imagined coming from the minds of men. Probably the most ridiculous and informal statistic of all this is the fact that of those six plus billion people who believe in sky fairies from pulp theism, less than one percent actually know what the contents of their pulp theism says. The majority of theotards are utterly ignorant as to what is actually written in their books of Babel. They believe what their gurus, their pastors, rabbis, and what other theotards believe because all religion is relative as to what is believed by its adherents. Christianity is a primary example of this absurdity, with over 60 plus thousand denominations and growing, all believing in different interpretations of dogma and doctrine from their single little black book. You can take a half dozen theotards on any given day and question each on a specific text in the Bible and you are sure to receive different answers from each of them. The oldest historians on the planet have recorded for posterity the origins of religion and how it arose into what it is today. And no Alice. The world's first inhabitants knew nothing about sky fairies. It appears to me that the first inhabitants of Helios had only the same gods as many of the barbarians have now, namely the sun, moon, stars, and heaven, as therefore they saw them always moving on in their course and running, from this their natural tendency to run they called them gods. But I think it must be evident to everyone on consideration that the first and most ancient of mankind did not apply themselves either to building temples or to setting up statues, since at that time no art of painting, or modeling, or statuary had yet been discovered, nor, indeed, were building or architecture as yet established. Nor was there any mention among the men of that age of those who have since been denominated gods and heroes, nor had they any Zeus, nor Kronos, Poseidon, Apollo, Hera, Athena, nor any other deity, either male or female, such as there were afterwards in multitudes among both barbarians and Greeks. Nor was there any demon good or bad reverence among men, but only the visible stars of heaven because of their running received, as they themselves say, the title of gods, and even these were not worshipped with animal sacrifices and the honors afterwards superstitiously invented. As is contested by ancient historians, the first and only thing worshipped and reverenced were luminaries in space, namely the sun, moon, and stars. The worship of planets and their human euhemerist counterparts evolved later. The adoption of omnipotent sky fairies came afterwards, and even longer afterward, 
the invention of a single omniscient sky fairy we call Dad and Santa Claus, etc. Before there was such a thing as blood ritual sacrifice we see invested within the books of pulp theism, such as the Bible, the earliest inhabitants of Earth only offered the fruit of the ground, namely trees, plants, and herbage. It is probably an incalculable time since, as Theophrastus says, the most learned race of mankind, inhabiting that most sacred land which Nihilus founded, were the first to begin to offer upon the hearth to the heavenly deities, not the first fruits of myrrh nor of cassa and frankincense mingled with saffron, for these were adopted many generations later, when man becoming a wanderer in search of his necessary livelihood with many toils and tears offered drops of tinctures as first fruits to the gods. Of these then they made no offerings formerly, but of herbage, which they lifted up in their hands as the bloom of the productive power of nature. For the earth gave forth trees before animals, and long before trees the herbage which is produced year by year, and of this they culled leaves and roots and the whole shoots of their growth, and burned them, greeting thus the visible deities of heaven with their offering, and dedicating to them the honors of perpetual fire. In a previous video I did on the subject of the Biblical Fall, I conclusively showed from scripture how the original lost covenant of the Bible Sky Fairy involved vegetation, and that the so-called fall of man involved the eating of meat from an animal. Being clueless, contemporary theotards continue in traditional theotard dogma, believing in magical fruit trees. When the tree of good and evil in the Genesis record is a tree of DNA, not Macintosh apples. I also expounded the numerous inferences throughout the Old Testament showing the Sky Fairy in that book had a big hard on for those who messed around with animals in eating them. But this lost vegan covenant is found in Genesis, the first book of Babel in the Bible. What is also contained in that first book, but unbeknownst to all theotards under the etymology of the English in its original languages, is the real story of the beginning, or rather the creation events. Moses, a character that is 100% fabricated and who never existed, did not pen the Torah. Any biblical scholar of any weight knows there are at least five pseudepigraphal authors who pen the Torah, verified simply by one of many facts, that the so-called Moshe dies three quarters of the way into Deuteronomy, and the Torah goes on. Whoever wrote the Torah was a cunning linguist as well as a creative story maker as underneath the surface transliteration is the Genesis story refabricated from previous civilizations and cultures, containing the names of a dozen or more gods. One finds the deities of the protogenesis story of earlier Canaanite and Indian civilizations, in particular the Baal Cycle and the Vedas. Now mighty Bay, son of Dagon, desired the kingship of the gods. He contended with Prince Yamneha, the son of El. But kindly El, father Shunam, decided the case in favor of his son. He gave the kingship to Prince Yam. He gave the power to judge Neha. Fearsome Yam came to rule the gods with an iron fist. He caused them to labor and toil under his reign. They cried unto their mother, Asher, Lady of the Sea. They convinced her to confront Yam, to intercede on their behalf. Asherah went into the presence of Prince Yam. She came before Judge Neha. She begged that he release his grip upon the gods her sons. But mighty Yam declined her request. She offered favors to the tyrant, but powerful Neha softened not his heart. Not to mention that you have 
two different sky fairies in chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis, as well as two completely different records of creation, verifying at least two different sources of the Genesis creation yarn. In what's supposedly called a pure language, Hebrew, one finds words of other civilizations and cultures such as Egyptian, Sumerian, Syrian or Syriac, Chaldean, Akkadian, and even Indian Sanskrit. The Old Testament word for seas is the Ugaritic and Vedic Yam. Yam in the Vedas is Yama, the brother of Shani, representing the planets Pluto and Saturn respectively. Shani, the Vedic god Saturn, is represented in the Bible for the word transliterated into the English, scarlet, as in the scarlet thread of redemption found throughout the OT, but also the scarlet robe worn by the Christ fabrication in the New Testament before his yama, or rather yam, or his death, as the brother of the Vedic Shani, or rather Saturn, is yama, the god of death, who is Pluto. Interestingly enough, in the Koine Greek of the New Testament, the word death is Thanatos, and Thanatos is Pluto, the Greek god of death. Thanatos is a twin brother of Hypnos in Homer's Iliad. The word Amen is found 72 times throughout the Bible, and it's purely Egyptian. So just like English, Hebrew is an ancient guttural language containing many stolen words and dialects from previous cultures, telling the previous tales of those previous civilizations and cultures. But the most recent of the writers on religion rejected the real events from the beginning, and having invented allegories and myths, and formed a factitious affinity to the cosmical phenomena, established mysteries, and overlaid them with a cloud of absurdity, so that one cannot easily discern what really occurred, but he having lighted upon collections of secret writings of the Ammonians which were discovered in the shrines and of course were not known to all men applied himself diligently to the study of them all, and when he had completed the investigation, he put aside the original myth and the allegories, and so completed the proposed work, until the priests who followed in later times wished to hide this away again, and to restore the mythical character, from which time mysticism began to rise up, not having previously reached the Greeks. There are no known extent copies of the Old Testament, because the originals were written upon papyri and they have all since disintegrated millennia ago. The Old Testament today is based upon the Masoretic Text, and the Masoretic Text was not written until the 10th century AD. 96% of the entire New Testament was written after the 9th century AD. The earliest autograph we have of the New Testament is dated to 150 AD, a hundred years after the Christ myth appeared. In all, both the Old and New Testaments were written on the fly. The stories and discourse developed over history and 95% of the names of the authors of the 66 books contained in it are frauds and forgeries, having no historical or scientific proof of them ever actually existing in the first place.
heads of archaeology and history in Israel itself today claim there was no such thing as an exodus from Egypt. Moses never existed, David never existed, nor did a powerful empire exist as written in the Babel. There was no Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. These are names placed upon the Gospels more than three centuries after the Aquarian avatar called Jesus, which name is directly and etymologically from the Greek Zeus, was said to have existed. A general study of the New Testament proves conclusively the God spell was a Roman political tool to squelch insurrection in the Roman Empire and in particular the revolution that gained ground over three centuries in what was called Judea by the Maccabean then Herodian dynasties of the time. Factions that believed in sky fairies to the extent of severe genocidal psychosis. One such group that existed during the time the Jewish Christ was supposed to have existed were the Sicarii who were your first century AD version of terrorist suicide bombers, except using daggers. The so-called apostle named Peter in the God Spells was a Sakari terrorist, and there is internal evidence from the God Spells that the Jesus fabrication backed the Sakari terrorist faction of the then Herodian dynasty. Historians have to have evidence, but what kind of evidence do they look for? The best kind of evidence when dealing with ancient periods is to find evidence that goes back to the time itself. If you had some contemporary eyewitnesses telling you how Simon Peter died, that would be brilliant. Unfortunately, you don't have that. You would love, though, to have contemporary accounts written, written like the next day from the events. That would be great. Uh, historians would love that kind of thing. Historians would love to have lots of sources. You want to have lots of sources that go back to the time of the events that are being narrated. You would like these sources to be independent of one another. If, if you have 20 sources, but they all got their story from the same guy, then you don't have 20 sources, you have one source. You want, you want 20 independent sources who all attest the same, uh, the same event. Moreover, you want these independent sources to be consistent with one another. You don't want them to be contradicting each other all over the map. You want them to be agreeing with one another. So you want them to uh, corroborate one another without collaborating with one another. Moreover, you want them to be unbiased toward the subject matter. You don't want them to be skewing things in light of their own self-interest. If you're an ancient historian trying to establish what probably happened in the past, what kind of sources do we have when it comes to the Gospels? The Gospels are our sources for knowing about the resurrection of Jesus. Are they the kind of sources that historians would want when trying to establish what probably happened in the past? I think the answer to that question is no. When were the Gospels written? Well, they are not contemporary to the events they narrate. Scholars debate when the Gospels were written, but by far the, the, the most common dating are that Mark was written sometime around 65 or 70 AD, Luke and Matthew about 15 or 10 or 15 years later, John maybe 10 or 15 years later, and John maybe around the year 90 or 95, Matthew and Luke around 80 to 85. These are the dates that are taught uh, throughout the universities and divinity schools and seminaries of North America and Europe. I, I take them to be right for reasons that I can give you if anybody really wants to know. It's a complicated argument. If these dates are correct, it means that our earliest account of Jesus' resurrection is 40 years after the event. 40 years after the event. It's 40 years after the event. 40 years after the event. Well, Paul was writing before that, wasn't he? Yes, Paul was writing before that. Paul talks about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians. Well, that's 20 years after the event, so that's better. The Gospels give us the narrative. Paul makes reference to it, but there's a 20-year gap. You don't have somebody who is there writing about it. Second point, 
None of the authors were eyewitnesses. Paul himself indicates that he was not an eyewitness, and none of the gospel writers was an eyewitness. People, of course, call the gospel books Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, they call them Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because we don't know who wrote these books, and there's no point calling them Sam, Fred, Jerry, and Harry. I mean, they're, they're written by people we don't know who they were written by. They are anonymous. You might not think so because they have the title, The Gospel According to Matthew. Whoever put that title on it was an editor later. The original books are all anonymous, written in the third person. Moreover, the followers of Jesus were Aramaic-speaking peasants from Galilee, lower-class men who were not educated. In fact, Peter and, uh, and John in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, are literally said to be illiterate. They couldn't read and write. Of course not. They were fishermen. They didn't go to school. The vast majority of people in the ancient world never learned to read, let alone write. And their native language was Aramaic. These books are written in Greek by highly educated, rhetorically trained writers who are skilled in Greek composition. Probably not disciples and don't claim to be disciples. Where did these authors get their stories from? Well, if they were not disciples of Jesus, they must have heard the stories from somebody. Who heard the stories from somebody, who heard the stories from somebody, who heard them from somebody. Stories about Jesus, including his resurrection, had been in circulation year after year after year from the time that his disciples knew that he got killed and believed he got raised from the dead. They told stories to convert people. They improved the story sometimes. They changed the story sometimes. The stories got modified in the process of transmission over the course of decades before anybody wrote the stories down. These stories are based on oral reports that have been in circulation for decades. What happens to oral reports in circulation year after year, decade after decade, they get changed. What evidence do we have that the stories about Jesus' death and resurrection got changed? You can read the stories yourself. Simply read Mark's account of Jesus' death and then read John's account of Jesus' death and make a list of everything that happens in both and compare your list. You will find that there are stunning differences. In fact, there are discrepancies. Let me give you just a list of very quick examples. What day did Jesus die on? That's a simple question. And luckily, we're told in both Mark and John. In Mark's Gospel, we're told that Jesus died the day after the Passover meal was eaten in Jerusalem. John tells us explicitly, chapter 19, verse 14, that Jesus died the day before the Passover meal was eaten, on the day of preparation for the Passover. That's different. He could die both days. What about the time? According to Mark, he died at 9 in the morning. According to John, he wasn't, he wasn't condemned to death until afternoon. John 19, 14. These are accounts that differ from one another. Did Jesus carry his cross the entire way to Golgotha, or did Simon of Cyrene carry it? It depends which gospel you read. Did both robbers mock Jesus, or did only one of them mock him and the other come to his defense? It depends which gospel you read. Did the curtain in the temple rip in half before Jesus died, or was it after he died? It depends which gospel you read. I can give you the references for all of these if you need me to, or you can look them up yourself. I'm not making these up. Those are just differences about Jesus' death. What about differences in the account of his resurrection? Well, who went to the tomb on the third day? Did Mary Magdalene go alone, or did Mary go with other women? Depends which gospel you read. If with other women, how many of them were there? What were their names? And which ones were they? It depends which gospels you read. Was the stone rolled away before the women got to the tomb, or not? What did they see in the tomb? Did they see a man? Did they see two men? Or did they see an angel? Depends which gospel you read. What were they told to tell the disciples? Were the disciples supposed to stay in Jerusalem to see Jesus? Or were they supposed to go to Galilee? Depends which gospel you read. Did the women tell anybody? Or were they silent about it? Depends which gospel you read. 
did the disciples ever leave Jerusalem? Or did they immediately, did they never leave, or did they uh, leave and go to Galilee? Depends which gospel you read. My conclusion, these are not reliable historical accounts. There are too many discrepancies. The accounts are based on oral traditions that have been in circulation for decades. Year after year, Christians tried to convert others by telling them stories to convince them that Jesus was raised from the dead, and they changed their stories while trying to convince people. These authors were not eyewitnesses. They're Greek-speaking Christians living many years after the fact. They're telling stories that Christians have been telling all these years. There was nobody there taking notes. Some of the stories were invented, many were changed. For this reason, these accounts are not as useful as historians would like as historical sources. What I've given you so far is really just kind of child's play compared to the real problem of why historians cannot prove the resurrection. And this is what I want to spend my last three and a half minutes on, the real problem. Mike and I agree that what historians try to do is establish what most probably happened in the past. That is the task of history. You can't prove the past. You can only give evidence for the past. And some evidence is more certain than other evidence. All the historian can do is show most probably what happened. What are miracles? Miracles, by definition, are the least probable occurrence of an event. If a miracle was not least probable, it wouldn't be a miracle. If somebody could walk across your lukewarm, the lukewarm water in your swimming pool, that would be a miracle. If the water was frozen, it would not be a miracle. But if it's lukewarm, I can tell you, none of you here could do it, and nobody in this world could do it. That's, That's six billion, billion people, people, so what are the chances of one person being able to do it? It would defy the way nature naturally works. I'm not saying that there are natural laws that are written down someplace that you can't break or you get in big trouble. Uh, scientists today don't talk about natural laws, but scientists do talk about highly predictable ways that, that, that this world works. And one of the way it works is that if you are a sentient human being trying to walk across the lukewarm water in your swimming pool, you won't be able to do it. What if somebody could do it? What would be the chances? They'd be, the chances would be infinitesimally remote that anybody could do it. Well, what if somebody could? Okay, let's say somebody could. The chances of them being able to do it are infinitesimally remote. Can you prove that this person probably did it? No, you can't prove it because you can't repeat the experiment of the past to show he did it. That's the problem with history. It's not like the natural sciences. The natural sciences work by repeated demonstration. And so, for example, if I wanted to show you that bars of iron will sink in that swimming pool and bars of ivory soap will float, all I need to do is to get 100 bars of both and start chucking them in. I'll chuck in 100 bars of iron, they'll sink every time. I'll chuck in the soap, they'll float every time. That gives us a predictive probability of what will happen the 101st time. That's how sciences work by repeated experimentation. Historians don't have that luxury. Historians can only establish on the basis of surviving evidence what probably happened in the past, and by definition, miracles are the least probable occurrence or else they're not a miracle. This creates the dilemma for the historian and is the reason why historians cannot prove Jesus was raised from the dead.